Hello and welcome to this special episode of the National Security Conversations. Today we have a roundtable discussion instead of a conversation. 2020 has been a momentous year thanks primarily to the arrival of the biggest crisis that humanity has faced since the end of the Second World War in 1945. And for us in India, we are perhaps facing the biggest crisis after the bloody partition of 1947. It's abundantly clear to all of us that COVID-19 will have far-reaching implications for our collective future in every sphere of life, be it politics, economy, human relations, or international politics. The question that is being posed to this roundtable today is what impact this crisis, COVID-19, will have on stability in South Asia and how we will deal with those implications for stability. Here are some of the questions that we are seeking answers to in this discussion. How will COVID-19 impact the various pre-existing conflicts in the region? How would COVID-19 affect regional population movements such as intrastate and interstate migration and refugee flows, among others? Thirdly, what about insurgencies and terrorism? Would COVID-19 have any impact on those insurgencies and terrorism in the region? And finally, and most pertinently, would COVID-19 lead to more cooperation in the region or will it lead to more competition in the region? We have five brilliant panelists to answer these questions. Ambassador Niripama Menon Rao was India's Foreign Secretary from 2009 to 2011. She was also India's Ambassador slash High Commissioner to China, United States of America and Sri Lanka. Lieutenant General D.S. Hudda was the Northern Army Commander of the Indian Army till November 2016. Suhasini Haider is a senior journalist and is a diplomatic editor of the Hindu newspaper. Max Rodenbeck is a South Asia correspondent of the Economist magazine. And finally, Dr. Rajeshwari Pillai Rajakopalan is a distinguished fellow and heads the Nuclear and Space Initiative at the Observer Research Foundation. New Delhi. Let me request uh, General Huda to give his initial remarks on the theme of the day. Thank you very much, uh, Happy Mon, and uh, you know, extremely glad to be here. Uh, so, uh, let me start by saying before we come to the regional situation, uh, I think we can't completely divorce ourselves from what is happening globally. And so, just very briefly, let's look at the uh, global situation. Uh, so my sense is the pandemic hasn't really uh, brought in significantly new geopolitical trends, but rather accelerated and exacerbated those trends that were already visible to us, uh, you know, in the international space. So the U.S.-China rivalry, the trade war was already going on. Uh, I think it's uh, it's got highly sharpened, and uh, we could see a trade and technology decoupling uh, between these two countries. It's, it's already it's already visible. Uh, there was a retreat of globalization, borders were shutting down, and now, uh, you know, you talked about migration. I think borders have got completely sealed uh, because of the pandemic, uh, and even opening up is going to be extremely challenging and difficult, and I, I don't see that kind of uh, uh, movement between countries as, as has been, uh, you know, witnessed in the past. There is a rise of nationalism. Again, that was something that was visible. Uh, now we are seeing a greater manifestation of that as, uh, you know, leaders attempt to deflect attention from uh, problems internally in handling the pandemic. Uh, and this is, I think, also one source of uh, future conflict uh, between countries. Uh, and finally, of course, you know, now the realization that there is over-dependence on China for supply chains. Uh, and so you could see uh, movement in, in that direction. Coming to the region... Uh, Happy one, as you, as you said, there was a good initiative taken to start with by this uh, SARC fund to fight the COVID. Uh, but unfortunately, at a time like this, when everyone should be coming together, we don't really see that even within, within the region. I think relations with Pakistan, we thought they had hit rock bottom. They, they seem to have, you know, become worse. Uh, diplomacy is completely dead. I mean, now with, with what is happening with the, with the missions on, on both sides, if you look at what is happening on the line of control, uh, the amount of firing that is going on uh, is, is in some ways unprecedented. And as infiltration also uh, continues. 
with nepal we were seeing some tensions in the past i think the map wars have now brought these tensions out in the open uh, positions have got hardened i think it will take uh, it will take some really deft diplomacy uh, to get our relations with uh, with nepal back on on track uh, on bangladesh uh, we do have a good relationship unfortunately uh, it got sard a little over comments on citizenship amendment act uh, that were made uh, but that's an area that i think we could uh, we could look at and uh, and see among all this i think the biggest challenge obviously is china uh, and we are seeing it uh, some of us have been saying that uh, you know this peaceful rise of of china and and india together is somewhat of a myth because of uh, long term strategic rivalry uh, so i think this uh, myth has has now been busted and we are going to see irrespective of how uh, the current situation on the lac pans out uh, i think there will be a reset complete reset in uh, in india china uh, relations and uh, you will also see in south asia Uh, greater chinese efforts to wean away countries uh, from the region and so india's uh, let us say dominant position in south asia uh, could be under some cloud uh, it's often felt that you know india's economic rise uh, and its policies would actually uh, enable the rise of other smaller countries in south asia that as india rises economically Uh, you know the other countries would also benefit the countries like bangladesh nepal bhutan uh, sri lanka etc uh, i think with the challenges that we have with our own economy currently uh, at least in the short term uh, that doesn't seem uh, likely now uh, i also don't think we have done enough uh, to encourage uh, you know trade relations migration flows etc are are soft power going to our neighboring countries to the extent that that we we could have uh, internally to uh, i think uh, covid 19 you know has made our politics more fractious so you see the opposition has been uh, attacking the government over its handling of the pandemic over its handling of the economy and now over uh, you know the handling of uh, situation along the the lsc so again at a time when you know uh, everybody at least in the political space should come together uh, to fight this crisis uh, you find you find bitter divisions that are taking place uh, and and finally on the internal security situation uh, see kashmir remains sullen uh, what has happened with covid 19 and a combination of the fact that uh, you know internet has been has been shut down or even when it opened it, it only came at 2g speeds at a time when everybody was locked up at home and was so much reliance on the on the internet uh, i i think it has led to greater alienation uh, among among the people how it will manifest we we still don't know i think the security situation is pretty much under control uh, the worry is uh, you know an out an outbreak of large scale street protest and we don't know what triggers uh, protests in kashmir it could be a small incident it could be a large incident uh, if that happens uh, that could be a challenge to uh, you know to the security forces uh, even nagaland uh, it was hoped that you know we could get some kind of accord going in nagaland it it's looking uh, fairly distant now and you heard about the governor taking over law and order duties uh, from the from the government and there is a again a bit of water board is going on between the nsc and i am uh, and the governor who is also the interlocutor so even if we can sort out the nagaland issue i think it will have a overall positive impact in the northeast region as a whole uh, but even that as for now doesn't uh, doesn't look like happening so does this look like a gloomy picture unfortunately it is a gloomy picture is there a bright spot uh, happy man uh, and i think there could be if the government starts seriously uh, you know looking at uh, internal and external issues uh, and making policy changes uh, that have so far been avoided internally in terms of human security and, and health and and uh, you know economic sort of betterment in external affairs uh, should it start looking at its neighborhood in south asia uh, you know with a little more positive light 
in order to wean them away from what you will obviously Chinese uh, attempt. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, sort of a reset in our relations uh, with China. Will it trigger a, a review of our relations with Pakistan? Unfortunately, it doesn't look so at this at this moment. Uh, although I think that's another area that that we need to look at. So happy one with these uh, with these remarks. Uh, I will rest here and thank you so much. Yeah, Huda, one one quick question before I go to Suhasini, and that is, um, you know, what does this double lockdown mean for uh, Kashmiris and the protests in Kashmir? <coughs> this is the first. Uh, summer after the uh, 2019 August Kashmir decision. Um, and from a Pakistani point of view, therefore, the absence of uh, large-scale protests in Kashmir would also perhaps um, and, you know, rattle them to some extent. Um, how, how do you sort of see the, um, the, the, the protest landscape uh, in Kashmir so, in the months to Okay, Abman. So, um, the protest landscape, as you're talking about, has been affected, obviously, by two things. One is uh, Atman, there is a large, very large presence of security forces. Additional uh, troops have been inducted. And so they have, uh, you know, tried to keep the situation sort of under control. Many lessons, Atman, have also been learned uh, from the 2016 protest. Uh, and I was there as the army commander. Let me frankly uh, admit that we were, we were surprised at the scale and scope of, of how the protest broke out. Uh, and many lessons were learned on how to control uh, these these protests, uh, you know, make sure funeral gatherings are not there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that is one part. Uh, I think also there is this fear of uh, you know COVID-19 uh, that prevents large-scale gatherings uh, from taking place, uh, and so therefore I think this has kept uh, protests under control. It does not mean that the people are uh, you know happy or uh, they are completely satisfied with what the government is doing. So let us see uh, how it how it happens. As I said, uh, we don't know the problem with with Kashmir is that you just require a small spark or a rumor, uh, you know, to to start this off so very quickly. So 2008 was because of Amar Nath Yatra. 2009 was some uh, you know rape alleged rape case in Chopia. 2010 was you had a Machal encounter, which was uh, later turned out to be a fake encounter. Uh, some incident, you know, that sparks off and then people come out on the street. It, it could well happen, if not immediately. Uh, as I said, this is probably the only long-term danger. I think the infiltration, firing, etc. from Pakistan is something that the security forces uh, can keep under check. So I, I don't see uh, much problem there. I think the problem will be internal. Thank you, thank you General Huda. Uh, with that, may I request uh, Suhasini to sort of give her opening remarks. Uh, thanks so much and uh, thank you, Happy Mon, for having me on this discussion. Um, the truth is that we are, we are always stuck between the two poles. You know, what's the ideal situation? What's the realistic picture? And I think General Uda has given in, in short uh, uh, what he calls a gloomy picture, but I think a very realistic picture. Has uh, the coronavirus pandemic uh, which is arguably one of the biggest global challenges we have seen over all these years, uh, has it actually changed the way states deal with each other and how states interact with each other and how states view challenges uh, bilaterally and uh, as the region? And I think the short answer is no. We've seen tensions with China uh, now at, uh, at a fairly, fairly grave point. Uh, we know that the tensions with Pakistan and, you know, the diplomatic situation with Pakistan uh, is not great. Um, the idea of the SARC helping each other has really whittled down into bilateral contacts. And where, you know, uh, uh, our contact with the South Asian nation, frankly, is not much greater today than it is with any of the other continents, South, you know, uh, with an African nation or... Um, uh, you know, our uh, assistance to any other part of the world. Uh, so I think uh, what we have proven once again is that, um, is that South Asia still does not see itself as a cogent region, does not see its special uh, uniqueness as opposed to dealing with any other part of the world. 
Um, so I, I could go on more about the security situation, and I really do think that that security situation has given us very little uh, to hope for. Uh, but I think what we do need to look at, and and in in forums like this, I would argue that we only need to really look at the way we can actually change what is already there. Um, we know what is already there. We don't trust half our neighbors. Half our neighbors don't trust us. The SARC, um, uh, you know, region has never get, gotten off uh, the ground beyond a few packs, which now seem to be being reworked. I think. Uh, you know, um, one more break in SAFTA and SAFTA will go away. One more break uh, in the motor vehicles agreement, uh, you know, after Bhutan uh, pulled away will make it irrelevant. So we can, you know, we can go on thinking in terms of that, in terms of, uh, 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 you know, the challenges that each of the country faces. But I do want to make a very strong pitch. And I know that this is, a, a, you know, a dream world pitch for why South Asia needs more than ever to look at the coronavirus pandemic uh, differently and study it differently as a region. Instead of trying to find what each of us has done, uh, and certainly we have more, uh, some countries that have been greater successes thus far and some that have not. Uh, let's also say that since the pandemic is still in the air, as it were, we still don't know who's, who has come out of it uh, really well, right? I mean, the Sri Lanka was one of the worst hit at one point. Today, it's seen as a success story. Uh, the worries that Afghanistan would be the worst hit. Yes, it, 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 they do seem to uh, have many cases. They are by no means any worse off, I think, than some of the European countries that were hit right at the beginning. Um, uh, and, the, and the third thing I would say is, uh, is that we do need to look at whether South Asia was affected by the pandemic differently. I know there are enough studies today that say, no, the strain is exactly the same as it was in South Asia. And no, the BCG vaccinations that we all have, have not made it different for us. Um, but equally, I will still just say, here are the numbers. As of June 21st, uh, South Asia reportedly had 765,000 um, cases uh, in all. That's out of a world total of 10 million. So uh, I, I will still make the point that actually we are seeing a lower incidence. The world cases, if you just look at per thousand, is about 1.14. So 1.14 coronavirus, uh, coronavirus cases per 1,000 worldwide. What is the South Asian uh, uh, figure for that? 0 0.4. You're going to tell me the next step is that we aren't testing nearly enough, so we don't know. But I'm talking about incidents within the people who are being tested. Um, South Asia, even as of June uh, uh, 21st, accounted for about 8.5% of the global infections, 4.1% of world fatalities. And as we know, it's 25% of the world's population, uh, if you count up about 1.9 billion in all. What am I, where am I trying to go with this? I'm trying to make the case that even when even though we have our differences at present, the need to understand whether South Asia was affected differently, whether South Asia's hospital systems, because we do have a lot of public health care uh, in each of our countries, whether they did things differently, these are matters of study and should not be rejected out hand. The second part to this is the medical um, part to it. As we know, when vaccines uh, have been discussed, uh, both Indian and Pakistani doctors have been at the forefront really of the medical research. Indian and Pakistani companies are in fact now being given patents to go ahead. Bangladesh is where many Indians are now sourcing remdesivir from. Uh, so the, the idea that South Asia is dealing with the world, each of the South Asian countries are dealing with the world when it comes to the medical um, uh, uh, the, the medical research and, and the way forward with the coronavirus, but not really working with each other, should be a matter of shame for us. We shouldn't have to wait for the next pandemic to find out how we can better uh, cooperate when it comes to research and development, when it comes to, given the, you know, the vast numbers we do have, uh, the idea that we cannot uh, manage our own uh, um, uh, testing in some way. Is, is, is something that really we should think about. I, I don't imagine that we are going to discuss this during the pandemic. But if we don't do it after the pandemic, then frankly, 
uh, it, it is our own failure and it is to our own detriment. The third part is going to be the economic part. We know that South Asia as a region is going to be hit economically. Um, in particular, I, I think the World Bank report says there's going to be a 6.3% uh, drop in growth across the board in South Asia. Uh, we know why this is significant, and that's because uh, we do have to worry about the bottom line much more, poverty levels in South Asia, um, malnourishment, food security, all of these are going to become issues. Uh, the fact that, once again, we cannot talk about this, that India and Pakistan, even in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, had a locust um, uh, crisis to deal with and really could not get uh, its cooperation uh, of the, uh, you know, out, uh, 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 worked out is something that's there right in front of us. Um, one small part of the economy which is going to hit us very uh, severely in South Asia is the migrant population. Migrant remittances are expected to come down. Uh, part of this is because um, the migrants are in fact employed in, in the Gulf region. The Gulf region has seen lower oil prices. The Gulf region has seen trouble in their own economy. And certainly we have seen that the Gulf region has tightened up on uh, visas and on uh, allowing migrants there. Therefore, what we are looking at once again is another crisis that is going to emanate. This is not going to perhaps hit us straight away because we're dealing with our own local migrant, uh, you know, from, from West India to East India or all of that. But we are going to have to deal with these migrant populations that will come back uh, to South Asia. Can we work something where we either um, cooperate on, on, on the research for how to best rehabilitate these migrant populations or to uh, work a sort of South Asian standard for when they are once again hired in the Middle East, uh, in other countries, and uh, whether we can work out standard rates so that we don't, don't end up you know, India doesn't undercut Nepal and Bangladesh is not undercutting Pakistan in all of this. Um, in order to uh, uh, work out, you know, South Asian global standards, I think it's important to look at because of the sheer numbers of labor that goes from there. Um, finally, I'm, I, I do want to say that, yes, we have not, uh, I mean, we have really not come up to standard when it comes to sorting out our problems, sorting out our security challenges, sorting out our bilateral issues in the middle of this pandemic. But the truth is that the world hasn't done much better either. And I think what we need to start talking about is what the new world leadership is going to mean. Let's be very honest, neither, the, neither of the two current global leaders, China or the US, has acquitted itself with any kind of uh, um, you know, excellence in this entire pandemic. China, for hiding what it knew about the pandemic, um, and you know, uh, later for not really being able to help others deal with the pandemic until it was already upon them, uh, uh, as well as uh, all the aggression that we are seeing from China, almost looking like China is taking uh, advantage of people's problems in the middle of the pi pandemic to push its territorial aggression. Uh, on the other hand, the U.S. has has uh, does not look like a great role model when it comes to. Uh, the healthcare system, when it comes to the kind of uh, um, cases we've seen over there, when it comes to uh, even the way it, uh, the U.S. tried to bully the world into give me the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, give me the hydroxychloroquine from India or give me some other medicine. Um, it, let's be honest, leadership in the world today is lacking. The U.N. system uh, that was supposed to have produced the WHO is also uh, you know, right with questions. So my point would be that this would be once again to situate ourselves in our geography and to try and, and, and look at how the world should be led in the future. There are all these new problems and all these new focuses. Will the world continue to just pay more for defense of each of, um, of the countries or are we going to put money into urban infrastructure, into rural uh, infrastructure, into uh, cyber security, into food security, uh, into health security, most importantly. Uh, and I think that it should be possible. I, I know that, again, I, I, you know, I speak in this dream world, but I cannot see why it shouldn't be possible for us as South Asians to come together to discuss these issues, which, to be honest, we all share. And we all, and there is no controversy over them in that sense, uh, without uh, seeing the kind of failures we have seen over the last few months when it comes to the SARS system. I'll leave it there.
So, Hasan, one quick question before I let you go. Uh, this, you know, the corona-fueled nationalism that we might actually witness in the in the, in the months and uh, years ahead. What impact will that have, in particular, on the refugee flows in in the region, as it were? Well, I, you know, to be honest, I think uh, nations are closing up. Uh, they are dealing much more with their own problems today and don't see. Uh, a, 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 the sense of responsibility or duty that in the old days would have um, uh, driven people to care about a refugee population or to worry about other things. I do think somewhere there, um, there are larger issues to think about. What is Corona making us morally do? Are we allowing democracies to be just uh, wished away? Um, and just, uh, you know, uh, in the name of Corona, are we allowing laws that uh, that, uh, that, that completely negate any sense of privacy and data security? Are we allowing, uh, uh, you know, few basic human rights uh, to be violated? Are people being arrested uh, for political reasons because coronavirus gives you a cover? Is the fact that there is a coronavirus pandemic out there, and therefore people cannot come out and protest? Of course, I'm not talking about America, where so many people came out and protested, and now we're seeing more cases over there. Uh, but the fact that we are in lockdown now for the fifth uh, month running, has that been used by states uh, to, in fact, crack down further on issues that have nothing to do with health? Uh, so I think the refugee population and uh, refugee problem, these are going to be situated in all of this. If we come out of this crisis, which, as I said, is one of the biggest global challenges, no better and uh, with no more morality and no more a sense of doing good for the world, than we did going into this crisis, uh, then I, 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 and I know most people will say, yes, that's what it is, because our economies are shattered. We are going, it's going to be each man for himself going forward. Uh, but I do think that's where leadership will count. And that's where a different way of doing things will count. Thank you, Suhasini. Uh, and if I may request Max Rodenbeck to sort of um, give his initial remarks. Max, over to you. Thanks so much, Habiman. I hope you can all hear me. Um, that's, uh, that was all very interesting. And uh, again, thanks, thanks, Habiman, for having me here. Um, and I enjoyed both uh, earlier presentations. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly. Um, I, I'll start with the big, the big uh, elephant in the room, which is China. Um, the biggest change that's happened really is the role of China. I mean, uh, uh, aside from what's happened with COVID, the biggest change you know, that, that really has affected the region and uh, is the focus of all attention just these days, of course, is China. And, you know, China has obviously become a far pushier player than it ever was before. Uh, the long strategy uh, that China followed for years of, of uh, you know, trying to uh, uh, look, look uh, weak uh, and waiting for the right moment is obviously very much over. And China has leaped right out of the box and is really throwing its weight around and being confident in ways that it had not been before. Um, and I mean, frankly, there, there are reasons for China to be confident, aside from changes in policy, changes in personality. Uh, there's clearly, there's a, there's a, there's a question there uh, uh, under the premiership of, 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 of uh, Mr. Xi. Uh, but uh, China also has reasons to be confident that one has to be aware of. And I, I feel sometimes in, in, in Delhi that, that this isn't, uh, not, not enough attention is paid to this. Uh, you know, of course, COVID started in China and has, has wreaked its ravages there. But China has had a far less burden, possibly, than almost any other country, uh, which is quite extraordinary. It's been the quickest country to control, uh, quickest large country to control COVID, and it's been the most efficient, and it's quite impressive. In the end, in the end, the end result will be that China will be perhaps the least economically damaged of any major economy by COVID uh, in the end. Uh, and so that's something one has to take into account going forward. Uh, all, a lot of these, these equations that one has seen, different curves, at what year, at what stage will China equal and overtake the United States, for example, in terms of its GNP, its economy, uh, we have to move that forward now. I mean, I think that people are now talking as early as 2030 or so uh, is the year when China will equal the US and then quickly surpass and go quite far beyond. So we're talking about a very, very, very big player. Uh, uh, and you know, it, it, this also means that on the curve of, of any sort of competition between India and China, that it's going to take India longer to catch up with China. Uh, 
I don't really have much faith in a lot of the numbers that are coming out now, whether IMF, World Bank, et cetera, estimates of which economy is going to suffer, which is going to, you know, how much uh, uh, each is going to shrink uh, uh, because of, of COVID. But I think one can say with some confidence that India is going to be more badly hurt than China in this, in this crisis. Uh, the signs are already there. India entered the crisis in, in a not, in not great economic shape, and it's been much worse hit uh, by COVID, not only in terms of numbers uh, of uh, the people affected by the disease directly, but in terms of the blow to the economy. So I'm afraid uh, uh, India is also set back in its hopes of, of catching up with, 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 with China. Um, but of course, in regard to China, the other big thing that's changed, I think and very much so in the last couple of months, and even more so in the last week or so, is that everyone else is now much warier of China than they used to be. So China has actually created enemies. This creates, this does create a new uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, you know, balance and situation in the world. Uh, so that, that has been an, you know, a, a quite a crucial change. Uh, China now has very few real friends uh, and uh, it's come out as a, 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 you know, a country that's not at all willing to, uh, sorry, not at all shy of using its uh, various forms of power, soft, hard, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we have a, 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 a new world where there is wariness of China and a new world where, where China is much stronger. Um, the, the other country I obviously must talk about is India. Um, and I'm afraid India is in a weakened position now, relatively speaking. I mean, I'm not going to be a, 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 you know, a fountain of gloom, but uh, uh, there's no question that, that India is in a weaker position. Uh, uh, India is also paying a price, and I think there's also something that, that uh, sometimes one doesn't hear enough in Delhi, India is paying a price for policies uh, uh, that, uh, you know, it has, it has pursued. Uh, there's a sort of, you know, the, the new, uh, in terms of foreign policy, the new sort of robust, unabashed, I used words like Mr. Arnab on television, uses this kind of pushy policy that India has pursued, has had effects, and uh, many of them are not good, uh, with India's near neighbor, uh, India has managed to provoke uh, Nepal. Uh, it is uh, uh, sort of lack of generosity with, with Sri Lanka has left questions over that relationship. Uh, uh, there have been insults to Bangladesh for no obvious reasons. Uh, you know, so th there's, a, there's a tension in with near neighbors who ought to be India's closest friends and allies, uh, uh, which seems completely unnecessary. And of course, tensions with Pakistan are at a particular peak right now. We don't need to go into that. Uh, then, you know, the, the, the last year, uh, August 5th, the abrogation of, of Article 370 and so on, um, you know, it's created uh, several outcomes which are, you know, not to India's in interests. One, obviously, is a more hostile population in the Kashmir Valley. Uh, but I think, um, you know, something that wasn't paid attention to enough, although I, I do recall that uh, Happy Man and I had a conversation about this last year, uh, was, was India's immediate decision after that to then push forward its conversation regarding uh, uh, Pakistani-occupied Kashmir uh, and to reassert India's territorial claims on all of that, including parts of which China uh, 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 gained control over when Pakistan ceded it to China. Now, you know, it seemed to me that it was a gratuitous provocation, actually, to, to start banging on about this in ways that were unnecessary. Um, and at the time, I feared someone would be listening to this and there might be a price to, say, to pay. It does seem that China was indeed listening to this. And there, this is the price that we see now, to a certain extent. Uh, so, I, you know, in, in a bigger, bigger sense, I think, um, you know, something I think would be worth talking about is, is that I do find in Delhi quite often that uh, um, there's a sort of inward lookingness of the Delhi uh, policy establishment that doesn't seem to often consider the, the effects of things, uh, that, that sort of pretends that India doesn't have an agency in the outcomes that, 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 that going, going forward. And I'm saying this in a provocative way to provoke discussion. You know? um, and, you know, of course, if you do something, there will be a reaction. And we see this across, you know, lots of different aspects of, 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 of India's current foreign policy dilemmas. Um, you know, policy uh, people here in Delhi seem to run in circles, you know, things bounce back and forth between South Block, North Block, block whatever, but don't really anticipate what might be happening further beyond that. Um, and of course, Delhi is not the only place where this happens. I mean, I'm very, very sure that the same sort of thing happens in Beijing, for example. But one would think that in a you know, sort of open democracy that there would be more debate about things and more discussion before uh, policies get enacted that might have consequences. Um, and I'll talk a little bit uh, to finish off about COVID and the effect of, of COVID. 
uh, I'm afraid that this you know, pandemic is going to set back all the countries of South Asia, all the countries of the region will be set back at least by one and possibly two years. Uh, and I, I mean, this is in terms of the economy, in terms of their place in the world. Uh, I think relative to other parts of the world, uh, Suhasini is right that perhaps the numbers do not look so bad in terms of the direct effect of the disease. But I think in terms of, of the, 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 the global impact on South Asia of the COVID uh, 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 um, challenge, that actually it has really very, very strong and bad impacts. And as Suhasini mentioned, I mean, one of these is, is migrant labor remittances, for example. This affects all the countries in the region and it's, they're going to take a very big hit uh, and they already have. Uh, so I'm afraid that South Asia is, is going to be uh, very badly hit, even if the actual numbers by um, com comparison or as a proportion of, of the world so far do not look so bad. Although we are still in across South Asia, we are still not at anywhere close to a, the, a peak in the curve. So we don't really know. So we have to be wary of that, uh, that one. Um, of course, things would be more difficult for India. The, the country that seems to be worst hit actually though is Pakistan. Pakistan is going to be even weaker, even more dependent on China. And I'd you know, like to point out that, that that actually is not necessarily a good thing for India uh, to have a weaker China, uh, uh, Pakistan more dependent on China. Um, and you know, just, just to finish off, I'd like to say that, you know, to, to uh, uh, again, in my, my rather, I'm afraid, <laughs> sourpuss kind of way of putting things, um, the, uh, you know, some, this is the COVID crisis has pointed out something else that South Asia has in common. Uh, and I'm very happy to blame this on uh, the British, uh, <laughs> is the legacy of low investment in public health over generations. Uh, and this is clearly something that is shared, it's shared uniquely across South Asia. I mean, this region, uh, um, you know, the numbers for all the countries in the region are remarkably low compared to any other region in the world in terms of government spending on public health. Uh, and I'd like to say that this, this, this is something that really needs to be addressed. And what is also remarkable is that South Asia at the same time has some of the very best examples of how to deal with problems such as COVID. Uh, and Happy Man will be glad to hear that, I mean, Kerala, for example, the way Kerala has managed the whole, the whole uh, uh, problem of, 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 uh, uh, of COVID is uh, uh, an example to be held up to the world, not just to India or not just to South Asia. They've done very, very well and done all the right things. So anyway, I'll stop there and happy to discuss any of this. Thanks. Max, before I let you go, one quick question for you. Um, you know, be, I mean, having the benefit of being a detached outsider uh, as it were. When you look at South Asia, do you think it is uh, time for India to sort of reset its um, um, South Asia policy in the uh, wake of COVID or, or is it too late already? I mean, given the fact that the uh, Chinese stranglehold over the region is on the rise, so even if India, India wants to, uh, is it in a, possible to, is it in a uh, position to do that? What's your, what's your quick take? I think it would be very, very difficult. I mean, you, you need, it would take a concerted effort um, across the policy establishment. And it's very hard to see that happening in, in India currently under the current government. Um, and also, uh, you know, it's a situation where there, there, I don't know if there's enough bandwidth, frankly, in, in the, in the, in the decision-making establishment. That's, some, that's another point that, that, that I might've brought up actually is, is, the, is the bandwidth problem. Um, and I, I think that uh, the, the lack of bandwidth in Indian policymaking is, is really showing up actually right now uh, when the government is, you know, trying to find answers, but not having, a, 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 not having an easy time of it um, uh, because there's not enough uh, focus and attention uh, put on, on things. So uh, I think a, a reset will be very difficult um, right now. Uh, although I would also say that because every country in the region is, is suffering from the current moment, uh, that there may be actually a certain willingness to rethink things uh, on the part of all the governments in the region. Thank you, Max. Um, Dr. Rajagopalan, if I could come to you next uh, before I go to Abbas Rao uh, for the final set of comments. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Happy, and uh, thank you for having me here as part of this uh, uh, round table here. Um, so uh, I was thinking maybe I'm going to go last. So I thought it was a good fit because I was also going to look at things in a larger Indo-Pacific uh, context because I think uh, it's uh, important for us to not restrict ourselves to the South Asian 
uh, geographical context because I think that only gives a part part of the story, but it doesn't really give you the fuller picture of uh, what's uh, the South Asian dynamics in a sense or India's own effect. Um, so I think uh, what we are seeing today, China's actions and reactions to start with, and I think it will uh, kind of uh, take off from where Max left off uh, in a sense, uh, talking about China, the big elephant in the room. I think that's the uh, that's a, a crux of the issue in a sense, whether you're talking about the COVID uh, or the regional security dynamics on both of those counts, China is the, is, the, is the crux of the issue in a sense. So China's actions, reactions is, of course, partly related to COVID. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, the China's aggressive behavior that is seen in both the uh, South Asian neighborhood, but also in the Southeast Asian as well as uh, against Japan and Taiwan on the East. Again, it's all a part of the uh, part of the COVID problem that it has, uh, it has to deal with. Uh, in fact, the, uh, uh, it has uh, a serious problem when it comes to the internal issues uh, because the manner in which it was handled within China and the kind of backlash that it has faced, even in terms of international, for instance, the management of the, or the sort of disinformation campaign and the management or hijacking certain institutions, multilateral institutions such as the WHO has brought in certain negative image about China. And I think that there is an effort to kind of uh, uh, sort of negate the, that impact and create a, a different narrative. And I think part of this aggression that you're seeing today is to be explained uh, from that domestic criticism and uh, so on and so forth. And I think uh, one of the essays that came out in the War of the Rocks, uh, if that were to be a sort of a, a, per, a, a sort of a, a, a a projection of the Beijing's view, and I think that's uh, it, it makes it very clear that there are certain domestic uh, narrative that has been the important context for what China is engaged in today. Uh, and because China has picked fights with literally every single nation, even in the case of Southeast Asia, when you look at it, for instance, uh, countries like Indonesia did not want to take a strong stand against China for a very long time because of the economic interlinkages. Uh, similar has been the kind of case with, uh, which has, uh, for instance, the Philippines government, which has maintained a rather soft, uh, uh, sort of a soft corner for China, has taken stands that are somewhat different in a sense. And Indonesia certainly has been pushed because the number of naval intrusions right from January onwards this year uh, into the in, uh, in Indonesian exclusive economic zone has clearly pushed the Indonesians to uh, take a stronger stand. And you could possibly see uh, the, 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 the emergence of a stronger, a harsher stand within ASEAN in, under the leadership of Indonesia, for sure. So I think there has been a, because the, uh, there is a, now a renewed and concerted effort uh, to uh, sort of a, uh, hold China responsible for a number of things, to push back on China for a number of uh, uh, things that are going on in the, uh, the aggressive behavior that we see. Uh, so th this is one consensus that is generally you see that there is China's responsible, uh, irresponsible behavior when it comes to the handling of the COVID and, uh, um, and therefore this kind of perception of how the second aspect is about the, uh, there's a lot that's been said about the impact on the region and uh, what has led to where we are and so on and so forth. But I want to take a moment to look at the future and what could be the future looking like and what are those kind of uh, uh, what are the future developments that are going to pan out in the coming year? So one is the, what is the kind of aftermath in relation to the regional balance in a sense, uh, balance of power equations, uh, both in terms of the South, South Asian balance of power, the Asian, the larger Indo-Pacific balance of power, but also at the global level, how countries are going to be impacted. Because I think uh, that balance of power equations at every level will depend on the kind of effect that uh, they have had from the pandemic and how they're able to come out of the COVID pandemic. I think that's going to determine their standing in terms of uh, their ability to kind of play the balance of power games. And I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's an important aspect. Um, so here again, uh, the US is, for instance, is suffering. Uh, you know, uh, the US is still not out of the woods. Uh, China, like Max said, has been somewhat least affected, I would say, and has managed to keep it at least uh, going by the official report, uh, the public reports, the open reports. Uh, it does seem that China has managed to uh, sort of come out uh, not too badly uh, affected by affected by the uh, COVID, but at the same time, we don't know the full story out there, and that's always a problem. But the fact is that uh, the U.S. is suffering. India is going to have a huge burden when it comes to the economic impact of the uh, of the COVID. And so again, uh, and you are already beginning to see this play out in a lot of the national security uh, um, uh, sort of uh, parameters. Uh, you're already talking about reducing your defense budget for sure. Uh, so your ability to 
play the national security uh, cards as well as your defense expenditure to stay uh, up to date with your capabilities i think that's going to be significantly affected uh, by the covid and uh, but i will again say that china is not going to be is not going to be com completely unaffected because if at the end of the day if the us and the other rest of the region is not going to do well china is china will face some effect because china has been an export oriented economy it is it was in the process of transition for a while now uh, but it has not completely shifted to a domestic uh, a sort of a market in a sense so there are going to be problems that china will feel china will feel the pinch if the rest of the uh, world is not doing well whether it is being the indo pacific region or in or in the us for instance because the much of the market was in the us so i think that's the uh, other important aspect about how uh, the uh, issues are going to come out sec uh, third is of course the um, uh, the preparedness, national security preparedness. And I, I think uh, the point that I want to bring out, especially in the current context is, for instance, uh, due to the COVID, the Indian army canceled, at least there are certain reports that talked about India canceling one of the exercises in the Ladakh region. And that could have, in a sense, one is that could have prevented, actually, if we carried on with the exercise, we may, we may have uh, sort of uh, identified the uh, Chinese intrusions much earlier on. And maybe uh, people have talked about, written about the intelligence failure and so on and so forth. But I think the having canceled the military, possibly a military exercise in the Ladakh region, I think that's also an important issue. So that it, COVID has also has a direct impact on the national security preparedness and how we are able to identify the threats and challenges in uh, for us. Um, because uh, so uh, finally to look at the whole question, um, has COVID really changed the dynamics in the South Asian stability, uh, security dynamics in a sense? I think things have already been in a flux for a quite some time. And I think this has been, uh, I think that at least in the last uh, few years, uh, the, rise of, uh, the rise of China has been a phenomena for 20 years now, at least very serious, in very serious uh, terms. Uh, but at least in the last 10 years, the kind of aggressive behavior of China has created new dynamics, which has also resulted in an, a number of different flux, uh, strategic fluxes, whether it is in terms of the Korean Peninsula, in terms of the East Asia, East Asian crisis uh, be between Japan and uh, China, uh, Japan, Taiwan, but also in the, in the South China Sea. But I think the COVID has certainly accelerated uh, some of these developments that have already been in, in a strategic flux. So uh, that's where I see. Uh, what is the way ahead? How do we get China to play by the rules? We are, nobody is talking about containment of China, but, uh, uh, or maybe there are. Uh, but they, I think the more important point is how do we get China to play by the rules of the game? Uh, and uh, for a long time, a lot of uh, different uh, analysts, theorists talked about integrating China into, the, uh, into global institutions, regional uh, engagements to sort of bring uh, China into the fold um, so that uh, China is, has an incentive to play, uh, to behave uh, in, a, in a sort of a uh, in not in a belligerent manner and so on and so forth. But I think on the contrary, China's inclusion, whether it is in ASEAN, for instance, each, each of these different cases, you can look at it. China's inclusion into any of these platforms has not really altered the behavior. In fact, China has gone into these institutions, created rifts in those institutions and created more problems. ASEAN is the best example again. Uh, you used to talk about ASEAN as a good case study, good example when it came to uh, unity and so on and so forth. But the minute uh, China has managed to bring in some of the uh, divisiveness within the organization. Maybe it's also because they were, the minute you talk about sovereignty and maritime uh, territorial integrity issues, you're always going to like, jump into problem. You're always going to uh, have these problems. But the fact is that China, I believe China has not really produced the kind of impact that one thought uh, with, uh, it, it would have with greater uh, regional integration or global integration. Again, the US has come to the very same understanding that include uh, economic opening up of China has not really the uh, has not really uh, created the desired results on the political front, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, finally, about the whole uh, uh, debate in the Indian context has been about as to how for a long time this has been the part of the debate that integrating China into India's economic growth story will diminish the potential for a conflict. 
again, uh, that uh, uh, economic integration with China uh, uh, sort of will give an incentive for China not to engage in sort of uh, adventurous kind of behavior, aggressive behavior. But again, that has not produced the, uh, the kind of results. It, in fact, I would say that it has not altered the nature of interstate relations that existed between, in, that, have, that exists between India and China. Uh, and if you look at the numbers, it's very, very clear. In 2000, uh, um, beginning of the decade, uh, beginning of 2000s, we were somewhere where the trade figures were about 3 billion, 4 billion. We have grown to about 100 billion, but so has been the rise of uh, growth and the uh, uh, rise in the sort of uh, competition rivalry and the potential for conflict has been always been on the rise, especially in the last few years. And um, you have had a Doklam, but Doklam was not going to be, I think a lot of us have written about it, Doklam was not going to be the first and the last, and you are beginning to see that. And uh, to deal with uh, sort of an, a, a China that is so paranoid, uh, there is nothing really that can be done. There is nothing that can you, know, you can do to kind of uh, uh, calm the tempers out there, because if you're so paranoid and if you have serious issues of that kind, there is nothing that India can do to kind of uh, uh, sort of make peace with China. You cannot buy peace with China through economic integration because China is China has a hegemonic uh, view of the world and and the Indo Pacific and the and the Asian region, and they don't want to see even a pure competitor, even if it is a marginal rise of India, they do have serious insecurities. And I think, but today the problem you that you really see is a result of the huge, significant power imbalance between India and China. The power differential between India and China has grown so much, and that is at the crux of the problem between India and China, and that's not going to go away. Uh, we can always try and do catch-up game, but again, it's never going to be um, sort of a good enough because, and we don't, we should not catch up uh, sort of a one-for-one -one kind of a capability mix. Uh, we have to understand and analyze if we have the necessary capabilities, required capabilities to uh, play a deterrent game with China uh, because catching up uh, one for one, I think that's a foolish game to go down because you will be um, withering away your hard earned resources um, uh, into kind of catching up game. And that's not because, if, for instance, I'll take the case of the Sino Indian border infrastructure. Um, sort of, uh, even if you were to talk about that, because we had a policy of not doing, building up our stride of the infrastructure for a long time, saying that, and this is a policy across the board, the military leadership, the political leadership, as well as the bureaucracy maintain that it is going to compromise our own um, security and uh, interests. Uh, but the fact that finally we decided in 2007, uh, to build up our infrastructure with the sanctioning of the 73 um, strategic infrastructure projects has not really gone very far. Uh, it's only at the end of the ch when China has completely built up and nearly done with their, with their uh, impressive infrastructure in terms of roadways, uh, railway networks, lodge depots, oil depots, all of that clearly shows that China has plans not only to uh, get to the border relatively quickly, but to plan to sustain uh, for a sustained operation in the border areas. And trying to catch up is not going to happen because even as we try to up the game in terms of building up our infrastructure, China is not sitting quiet. There is, China is also upgrading its facilities, so there are going to be serious. So at the end, uh, I'll just conclude by saying that it is a huge power differential that is going to be uh, at the crux of the problem. So unless we find a way to build up our capability to deter China, uh, we are always going to be trying um, and do this catch up. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Rao, it's, it's over to you now. Uh, we have a very uh, gloomy scenario of that uh, in front of us. It's, it's, it's now for you to give us a more uh, optimistic and positive view um, as, to, as to whether the states and leaders in the region um, will do something to alleviate the impact of uh, COVID-19 on, on regional stability as well. Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you, Happy, and uh, I'm very pleased to be on this panel with so many distinguished speakers. Um, uh, talking about a gloomy scenario, uh, yes, I agree that it's very much, uh, to use a gaming term, a Dungeons and Dragons uh, scenario, I think. Uh, uh, much of South Asia is in a dungeon, and then we have a dragon, not a medieval dragon, but a 21st century dragon that has grown many tentacles uh, staring uh, down at us. Now, I often recall the term that um, the late foreign minister of Sri Lanka, Lakshman Kadirgama, who was assassinated by the LTTE, as you would recall, in 2005, uh, he used to always say that South Asia is an integer. It's meant to be integrated. It's meant to hang and be together uh, by virtue of geography, by virtue of history, by virtue of the languages we share, 
the ethnicities that uh, unite us and uh, our history uh, for that matter. But we have, in fact, today, we're faced with so many constraints, whether they're historical, whether they're political, whether it's a lack of focus on prioritization, uh, on connectivity, for instance, totally beset with contradictions. And that's the scenario uh, which has now been uh, further complicated by what people call uh, a disease of mass destruction, which is COVID-19, COVID uh, which has affected all the countries in the region, all the eight countries that we define as being part of South Asia. Uh, in fact, uh, an acquaintance, uh, a Parsi uh, woman who lives in Karachi, was telling me yesterday that uh, the COVID-19 situation in Pakistan uh, has been totally mismanaged by their government and the cases are mounting so rapidly because people are not uh, observing rules of quarantine or isolation, be that as it may. I mean, not that the situation in, in uh, where the rest of us are concerned uh, it should make us sanguine because, uh, you know, as they say, it, it ain't over yet. Uh, we're still to see uh, where it, when and where it's going to peak. Now, in this uh, mass of contradictions, in this uh, welter of contradictions we're we are immersed in, I, obviously the India-Pakistan relationship uh, is, uh, is what stands out and the very, very complicated and uh, almost impossible relationship that the two countries have. I think one truly conceived in hell and constructed on earth. Uh, the, it's driven by prejudice and hostility and it in many ways is a subcontinental rock of ages, I think. It's not going anywhere. So that being what is what it is, and if you look at, uh, if you're asking the question as to how COVID-19 is going to affect our stability or affect our prospects as South Asians, uh, there's very much, very little um, uh, hope that you can inject into the situation. And I think all the speakers before me have essentially, um, you know, supported that premise. Uh, so the pandemic has only accentuated, I believe, the divisions among us. Because uh, I know at the outset, Prime Minister Modi convened this meeting of SARC leaders to discuss the COVID situation. And, uh, you know, that seemed to inject a ray of hope into all the, all the uh, despair that surrounds us. But uh, post that meeting, I'm really not able to uh, put my arms around uh, the substance that has emerged in terms of the cooperation that you see across borders. Uh, because everybody, I think the problem with South Asia today is that we've all uh, turned inwards. Even as you, know, you talk of globalization collapsing across the world uh, and uh, and all the attendant uh, complications from that, it seems here, even if we have not said no to globalization, uh, our inwardness and our insularity seems to uh, create a, a kind of barrier and a kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, closing of doors, as it were, that doesn't look good for the future. Now, uh, everybody talks of the depth of engagement between the US and China, and we, in India, we in India have our own problems that, uh, that stare at us uh, on the border we share with China, the unsettled border and the very, very, um, you know, uh, tense line of actual control between the two countries. And that has emerged in the midst of COVID-19. Uh, you know, think of a crisis choosing a, a worse time to confront us even in the midst of all this. And as I said, globalization, the process of globalization has also tested positive to the virus. So you have all the attendant insularity that comes with it. Now, the dissonance in the region really, um, you know, tells us that how long can we continue with this? Is diplomacy dead in South Asia when it comes to dealing with the problems? Because the whole SARC project, the South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation Project, has, uh, has just sort of dragged itself along. I mean, it seems it's so crippled, it's so uh, challenged and handicapped in so many ways. I don't know how we are going to revive it. And at the heart of it lies the India-Pakistan relationship. I've seen in SARC how any initiatives that were taken always ran aground, uh, sometimes because the Pakistanis opposed it, sometimes some other countries opposed it. 
So it's a whole story of promise denied and potential unfulfilled. I think that's really the, the, uh, the rubric that one can provide uh, for this. So the trends that are already visible in our region, the India-Pakistan conflict, now the tension with China, uh, you know, the uh, problems that some of our other neighbors have with India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, these are very visible today and I don't believe they will dissipate just because COVID-19 has been dealt with or it goes away. So the stability question still, still remains. India's size and the asymmetry, I suppose, uh, in South Asia that our size really presents to our other neighbors is, is something that will not go away. And uh, whether we are able to use at least some uh, possibility of contact between the youth of the region, for instance, people to people contact, business to business level contacts, how do we promote regional integration, at least on these fronts, are questions that present themselves to us. There is definitely a pull of gravity that, that draws our smaller neighbors towards India. And, uh, and you see it with Nepal, I see, I've seen it with Sri Lanka having lived there. And even though the Chinese are, are now a very much a presence in South Asia, for long we resisted China's entry into SARC. And uh, today it has little meaning, that whole question of entry, because China is still, is, st is very much with us today. It, it is in the region. It uh, imbalances India's presence in the region and India's potential to build closer relations with its neighbors. I think uh, the future has already entered uh, and uh, we are confronted, uh, we are confronted with it. So, uh, and on the other hand, you have the China-Pakistan relationship, a coalition that has already coalesced in many ways, I think that uh, walks a very fine line between India and Pakistan. And I think the whole question of what is happening in Ladakh, I think should make us think, introspect very deeply about this. People talk about the reorganization of Jammu and Kashmir and the creation of the Union Territory of Ladakh. And just looking at the new map of that, uh, of, of that part of India, uh, and you see the, the, uh, the size of Ladakh today, it, uh, Leh is the second largest district in the country. It covers about 46,000 square kilometers approximately. And uh, it uh, reaches out into Gilgit and Skardu and the uh, tribal areas of 1947. And uh, the whole uh, action, you know, is also that of Leh district. You know, so uh, Leh is, is now uh, a factor. The Leh district is now a factor that straddles both our problems with Pakistan and our problems uh, with China uh, in, in, a, in a real sense. So what is, I mean, are there any bright spots to this? I would have thought that our cooperation in South Asia, in public health, uh, you know, our scientific cooperation, particularly in the field of research to see how we can, uh, you know, deal with treatments, mitigation, vaccines that prevent, uh, that will ultimately prevent COVID-19, although that process is going to take some time, even if we find a vaccine, I think it's going to take about two years to stabilize the process. Uh, the history of the polio vaccine should, should be instructional in that context. It took about five years for the polio vaccine to take hold, even after 1955, when it was, uh, when it was first discovered and developed by Dr. Salk. So uh, what are we doing in the field of public health? What are we doing in the field of, uh, of building more capacity in in the numbers of doctors and nurses that we have in the region. Uh, the numbers that we have in India per thousand population of doctors is still, you know, below one. It is, uh, it is one and above, surprisingly, in Pakistan and Sri Lanka, strangely enough. Although our hospitals and uh, the beds available for treatment, all that, I think, is far below, below par. So there is a huge initiative needed uh, to at least build cooperation and build bridges and more integration between our countries uh, in the region uh, to deal with these problems. We need not politicize the everyday when it comes to cooperation in these areas. And as one of the speakers said, we need more standardization in South Asia. What is the South Asian standard today? I think for the rest of the world, it just, uh, it just uh, you know, presents a picture 
of a lack of integration, perhaps a semblance of chaos, uh, you know, problems that don't go away, uh, you know, the fact that there are great inequalities, uh, problems left over from history, a lack of connective connectivity, and um, where issues of sovereignty trump issues of integration and um, and are not mutually compatible with each other. So we need a multi-track diplomacy. Everybody talks of uh, you know uh, multipolarity, and uh, but for India, for a country like India, I think uh, we need to take very astute, deft, and nimble steps to develop a multi-track. Diplomacy, whether it comes, whether it is a question of how we uh, even contain the Chinese threat to us, or whether it is a, a question of greater South Asian uh, a success on the South Asian diplomatic front. So I've, I've said earlier in, uh, in other fora that maybe it's a time for multiple alignments that we need. And, uh, and uh, you know, we are not today in South Asia for the rest of the world, we are not a geopolitical actor. I, we can only be that if we are able to, uh, to deal with the issues that divide us. And that brings me back to the heart of this all, which is the India-Pakistan relationship on which I think we really need a more imaginative, uh, future-oriented, long-term approach if we are to really make South Asia that geopolitical actor on the global stage. I, but I just want to say that although we um, um, initiated this discussion to uh, focus entirely on the impact of COVID on regional stability, a lot of issues have come onto the table, including um, the, the role of China, um, the, the importance of, um, as somebody put it, regionalism is perhaps dead in South Asia, um, and how um, COVID will perhaps sharpen the pre-existing conflicts in the in the region. And I thought that this question that Nirupama um, Subramaniam um, asked about uh, what do we mean by national security in some sense? Um, will, will, you know, what about human security? What about health and security as it were? Uh, will COVID force uh, the uh, states in the region in, in particular and the states in general uh, to rethink what it um, uh, means to be secure, what national security entails? Um, and, 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 you know, given the fact that COVID has thoroughly exposed the so-called national uh, security preparedness, as it were, I think there are, there are, these are intersecting questions that we can't um, um, avoid in the, in, the, in the days to come. Uh, but I thought this, this point about um, um, India and its uh, um, future friendships or allies, uh, and Raji ended the conversation by saying that uh, you can't sort of get into pious platitudes like um, multi-alignment, that's not going to take you anywhere. Um, you're going to be left in the lurch. It's, it's time for India to choose sides. Um, uh, you know, while, while that may be um, um, Dr. Rajagopalan's argument, I think um, there is going to be a um, um, sort of this, a lot of discussion in India, in the strategic community about shedding its um, uh, past aversion to alliances um, and also about um, 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 rethinking perhaps even strategic autonomy um, that we have here so used to. Um, but in any case, I think what, what, it, what this discussion tells us very clearly is that uh, COVID has, at a, uh, has come at a time or struck us at a time when uh, um, things were not very uh, 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 rosy and things were not very wonderful um, in India and in South Asia. And this is probably going to um, um, further uh, shock the uh, region and, and, and push us towards uh, more, more chaos and instability. Um, uh, with that, thank you all so much for uh, joining this roundtable, this Chow Track roundtable organized by CSDR. Um, and um, um, I hope you all stay safe, uh, do wear a mask, uh, unlike what Trump does. Um, uh, thank you all, um, uh, the participants and panelists, for joining this conversation. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.